we have Robert Rowley, who is a, uh, he works for what I understand is Trustwave in their Spider Labs division. Is that right? Is that right? I don't want to get anybody in trouble here. So, um, and he's going to talk about de uh, detecting and defending against state actor surveillance, which, uh, as we all know, you know, certainly in the past couple of years, we all know for sure that the, uh, the state is as much a threat as um, a lot of the other threats that are out there. So, hey, let's give a big uh, party track. Welcome to Robert. All right, thank you all uh, for showing up at this uh, one o'clock. I'm certain most of you have just woken up. Um, hold on, my friend. Let me turn on my notes. Um, yeah, definitely thank you for choosing the presentation. Uh, I'm going to be talking about detecting the surveillance tools that state actor surveillance groups are using. It's an extension of a series of blog posts that I posted earlier this year to the Spider Labs blog, uh, blog.spiderlabs.com. It details how to detect and defend against the uh, state actor surveillance tools that were released earlier uh, or late last, last year, 2013. Uh, foremost, uh, foremost is uh, who is this guy? Right? I'm Robert Raleigh. My day job is working as a security researcher for Trustwave. I work in their Spider Labs division, uh, the Spider Labs department. Uh, I specifically do vulnerability assessment. Uh, that's not really what, there's not a lot of crossover between what this talk is about and my actual day job. I pretty much write Ruby code all day long and this is really a, not specific to the work that I do but it's a great example about the organization that I work for and how they allow me to kind of basically run on my own to do my own independent research and they're, they're willing to let me have their, their name on these slides which is quite amazing. Uh, I've been part of the Southern California hacker scene. I've been going to DEF CON since DEF CON 9. I've been going part of the Southern California hacks hacker scene for 10 plus years. Uh, I feel very old but I really started doing all this when I was 14 or 15 years old choosing a Linux computer instead of a car. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I was stuck at home a lot and I got a lot of walking in. Um, you can hit me up on Twitter at, ha at I am Lay, a I A M L E I. Uh, you can hashtag harass me all you want. I don't care. Uh, you can think, you can do it during, after, whatever. But uh, again, back to me is uh, I was identified as a security researcher now as a formal title, but years and years ago, it was uh, somebody else told me that I was a security researcher after some fun shenanigans I had here at DEF CON where I'm actually the guy that's responsible for that free cell phone charging kiosk at the Wall of Sheep. So anybody's battery's dead, please feel free to go to the Wall of Sheep, charge your phone for free. I swear it's all on the up and up. On a good note though, I'm probably, because of that charging station, I'm probably the reason why the paid charging station that was also here at the Rio the first year that I did the malicious one, I'm probably the reason why that thing is gone. <laughs> I don't think it lasted the weekend. Uh, uh, so yeah, I've been given a lot of presentations uh, about, you know, uh, cell phone stuff, some web stuff, a lot of crazy stuff. This is completely different. It's just kind of a, a tie into some kind of pseudo activism stuff that I've also been kind of uh, associated with. I've given, I've talked with some activist groups like Restore the Fourth down in Southern California. Uh, I, I like what they do. They do things that I can't do but uh, I can't do alone. Uh, I care a lot about privacy. It's always been a concern of my, my, my own, uh, you know, personal concerns. And especially after what happened in the last year or so, we kind of escalated everything. I've been interested in privacy though for about uh, four or five years. In fact, it goes back to about ten years and I'll get into that story. Uh, but before, yeah, I'll just go ahead and get into that and go on. Um, I should also take note, everybody here, uh, I have a thing that I don't like hearsay. A hearsay is a story with no tangible evidence. It's something that you heard from a third party or heard from a second party or you feel like happened but you don't have any tangible evidence to back up your story. I really loathe uh, how that is. I do appreciate somebody who, who can show me evidence as opposed to somebody who just says this is how it is, this is how I think it is. Um, there's a lot of this going around, uh, mostly not with necessarily this community so much and DEF CON hacking technical, technical oriented people. You guys all have logical mindset where you know how things add up and how things work but I see a lot in the activist groups, uh, especially uh, LA, Southern California area where there's a lot of mm, this is how I feel things happen. I really feel sad. But uh, going on to this talk, I'm going to cover a couple of categories of the surveillance catalog. I've kind of explained the introduction already. Uh, I'm going to give a quick 
kind of like an introduction, explain some things, kind of give some backstory on some things. Then I go into the talk about the detailed information in the surveillance catalog leaks, which is what I'm calling it. It's the TAO release uh, from alleged NSA top secret documents. Uh, for anybody here who has a security clearance that may be worried about me leaking the security clearance information, I have you covered. I'll explain it in a bit. Don't worry, you will not have any risk of uh, seeing any top secret documents leaked here. Um, but yeah, basically the, the documents were released at 33, 30 C3 last year in 2013 by a researcher, journalist, uh, person who explained how everything was. Uh, I looked into them and uh, I'll get into more specifics on it but after they were released is when I started writing up the blog post because that's kind of how I felt. Nobody was looking at it as let's find evidence for this. So I wanted to give people information on how you find evidence for these things, so how you detect against them so you know you are or are not being uh, spied upon. Yeah, yeah, it's all the focus on this talk is to detect how to find the tangible evidence. This talk is not peddling snake oil, which is key. I'm not trying to sell you a service or anything like that. I'm not trying to buy you a safety net from evil aliens, the Illuminati or the owl farm. Uh, any other con con controllers of the universe, anybody who's uh, reading your thoughts or minds, I'm not trying to protect you from those guys. Uh, you just need to seek out psycho psychotherapy. So, foremost, let's understand who is involved in this matter. The, these are surveillance states. They're looking at what people are doing. People don't feel good about that. So, there are spies and those that are spied on. Simple. Spies can spy on other spies, but those are two factors in this matter. Somebody's either listening in or somebody's being listen listened to. Uh, people gather intelligence, they spy on other agencies that gather intelligence. It's about how they use the intelligence and the information that they're gathering for good or evil. Remember folks, it's who they, he who win wars that writes the history books. Uh, I've actually been spied upon in my life. Uh, this is really where the core of my ideals and activism works. I, I believe it was the, uh, I like to call it a scare and care that happened in 2001, 2002, right after certain events in this country. Uh, that allowed the agency to, that was doing the spying to look into everything that I was doing at the time and I was aware of this because they weren't really good at what they were doing at that time. They came up to my house, they asked for the name on the DSL bill which was my grandmother because I was living at my grandmother's house. So they assumed that she was the individual who was responsible for all this activity on the network. So they sat down with her <laughs> in the living room with their guns on their side, just nice, happy, you know, well dressed agents. They had guns on them and they sat down with my grandmother and they talked with her for 15, 20 minutes, probably only five minutes. I wasn't aware, I wasn't around for that, but they saw a laptop on her dining room table and they just assumed it was her laptop that I bought her so she can play solitaire, so she wouldn't have to shuffle. They just assumed. And, uh, and then I heard my grandma call and <laughs> I came out and said, hello. And they said, oh, that you're who we're looking for. Little 18 year old me. Uh, uh, eventually, those agents, uh, I follow them. So, I hope if, if he's here, I'll love to talk to you again if you remember that story and remember who I am. So, again, like I said, it's all about who spies, why do spies spy. So, spies can spy for good or they can spy for evil. It's what they do with it. But reality is they spy as a job. They justify their actions as for greater good or, or for better words, what's what their duty is. It's their job. If they don't spy right or they don't spy enough, it's their, their job, they lose their job, they lose their money, they lose their family, their house, etc. so forth. So you have to understand that it's not necessarily inherently good, it's just whether or not they have the morality in their own soul to say this is wrong and tell people about how it's wrong or refuse to do that work, find other work. To take from my previous slide, it's about uh, he who wins wars writes the history books. Uh, Alan Turing is a good example of somebody who did a great thing and he was breaking encryption. He was spying on what was the, at the time the Axis powers and using his math, using his knowledge to break their encryption protocols to be able to listen to their stuff. He did bad if you look at it from the Axis point of view. He did great if you look at it from the Allied point of view and coincidentally Allies won World War II. Post-war, we all know how he was treated and uh, we know how that works. So again, it's, it's when you're valuable, you're invaluable and when you're no longer valuable, they'll treat you just like they were originally. History is always being written though. We're in a very interesting time right now. There's a lot of current events. Who here knows what's going on, like all the current events? 
Is surveillance state fear a, a new thing for anybody here? Uh, I highly recommend actually looking back all the way to the 70s. Most of the stuff that we see today is just a repeat of exact many similar things that were happening back in the 1970s, which is when there was a great overhaul in privacy laws in the United States. But look back, I'm not gonna dwell too much on that. Uh, I'll just go ahead and go on. Full disclosure, again, I loathe tinfoil hat wares. Uh, people come up to me crazy whimsical stories after I've given this or similar talks and they talk about how their, the Illuminati came in and black bagged their girlfriend. By the way, hint, hint, she's just not returning your calls. I can't help you if, uh, if you don't have physical evidence. In fact, I'm frankly, to be honest, not really interested unless you have physical evidence. I'm very interested if you have physical evidence and you can show me something that was happening. To date, nobody's come forward based on these leaks and actually shown physical evidence of one of these bugs existing or having been found. To go in though, there's a story here. In 2010, well before this information was released and what I'm gonna be talking about today, there was an individual who did write up uh, a story, they contacted wired.com and one of their publishers published a story about how they found a GPS tracking device in their car. So this has happened, this is not related to the leaks that we're talking about. So it has happened, this information is out there, you could probably find it if you look. You just have to know. Uh, if you see something that doesn't belong, unplug it, see if a black SUV shows up and some guys in suits try to talk to you. Yeah, the, this is the only major story that I found. Um, I'm familiar with it because it was from Southern California, which is where I'm from. Uh, it's, so it's basically a, the only thing that has evidence, it's the only thing I was aware of that had evidence. Obviously nobody, nobody accepts or admits involvement to it. So that's what you can expect in the end. But what happened was there was actually a Wired article and something tangible was presented and discussed in the public's, public arena, which was a great thing. So getting into the beef now, what is the surveillance catalog? Uh, as I mentioned before, something written, uh, written up by a presenter, a journalist, a researcher, uh, 30C3. It was released in Der Spiegel as well as uh, during that conference kind of at the same time, right around just after Christmas 2013. Getting into the surveillance catalog leaks, yeah, Der Spiegel. They had lots of details on how they worked, kind of an idea. There's a lot of missing components. But what was most interesting was a lot of people alluded to assume what the source was, was Snowden. But the source, the leak information that was leaked was actually the source was never credited. So it's unknown if it was directly related to the Edward Snowden leaks. What I can tell you is that from my knowledge of which reporters and news agencies have released information about Snowden first, your Spiegel wasn't on that list. So they possibly never had the uh, actual copy of Snowden's leaks, nor would they be going forward with this information while other ones were ignoring it. So you can consider that. Uh, there's been a lot of talk recently about this considering maybe there's a second leaker. I'm, I'm, don't know really what it is, either a second leader, leaker, either it's information they had from perhaps a WikiLeaks type source or something like that because we know there's connections with the researcher involved with it in WikiLeaks. So. Yeah, they're basically not necessarily Snowden. A lot of people like to say Snowden. Uh, it could be a, a second shooter uh, or leaker. Uh, maybe they're on the grassy knoll or, or through WikiLeaks. Let the conspiracy theories begin, but please keep them away from me. So this is what I promised earlier. I'm introducing a character called Surveillance Sam. This, this character, Surveillance Sam, is helping me avoid showing secret documents during the talk. It's also because when I thought about, you know, uh, how do I show the images that I don't own the copyright for because they're part of top secret documents, I didn't know if I could necessarily call the NSA and say, hey, can I use these in my slides? I just kind of assumed what their answer would be, so I took the pro appropriate an action, created my own character. I think more people should be doing this. He's copyright free, everybody can have him. Uh, I've got stickers up here as well and uh, there's a vendor in the vendor area, Hacker Stickers, who also has the stickers available. So come see me. Uh, he comes with, obviously as you can see, he comes with my special limited edition black helicopter and anti-whistleblower karate chop action. All right. Thanks for listening to my spiel so far. Let's get into some actual details, all right. So information, we're going to start, it's four sections. Uh, we're going to start off with hardware bugs. After each section, feel free, if you have a question, raise your hand, go up to the podium, kind of hoot and whistle, try to figure me out. Uh, so I don't want to jump back and forth if anybody had any specific questions. First, and again, the first introduction of surveillance, second introduction of now of surveillance Sam, this is a series of hardware bugs. These are all called retro reflectors. Rage Master is a bug that attaches to your VGA cable, typically along the red uh, data feed. It is used to 
transmit the data from your, red, your VGA cable's red feed to a remote source so they can kind of see what's on your screen. Loud Auto is basically an embedded microphone in systems. These have existed since the 60s and well, we, well before. A little miniature microphone that when a, an RF signal is sent to it, starts transmitting what it hears in the room. Uh, same thing, Tardriard is a radio beacon. Kind of think of like this as RFID on crack. They can track down where a physical device is, maybe a laptop, they've connected to a laptop or a phone. They can use radio beacons to try to find out where you are, hunt, hunt you down. Uh, Surly Spawn, uh, similar to the Rage Master, is a, a system that's embedded in line with your keyboard now. And they transmit, when it sends an RF signal to, to turn it on, it starts transmitting what you're typing on your keyboard. Uh, basic ideas here, very simple. They all collect information and send it over the RF frequencies, radio frequencies. Obviously we know how to fix this is by wearing a tinfoil hat. You can go call the EFF and maybe get a limited edition tinfoil hat. By the way, not sponsored, not real, that was a joke. It wouldn't detect anything and that's really not what the point of this, hat, this talk is again. So please don't actually think tinfoiling up your stuff will tell you if somebody was spying on you. It's a good thing as a deterrent but it won't tell you somebody was doing anything. You'll running, be running around with a non-stylish hat. Unless somebody figures that out and makes it cool. Uh, and you can, this actually tracks back to what I mentioned before, juice jacking. It's uh, the malicious cell phone kiosks. It's something that I did a while ago and everybody starts, it's gotten, gained a lot of popularity. It's been back in the news recently, just coincidentally. People are releasing these items called USB condoms and such where it removes the data lines from your USB port so that you can uh, charge freely. Uh, again, this is a problem that I feel is if that prevents something but it doesn't tell you that somebody was actually trying to get data off of your phone. Uh, surprisingly enough, uh, that there's a solution for that. It's called plugging your phone in. It's kind of scary, kind of scary. But when you plug your phone in, if your phone, most phones, Android phones, iPhones, will tell you if it's trying to negotiate with a computer and if you want to access it. And that's the point in time. Perhaps plug in a burner phone you're not af not afraid to lose, or plug in another device. Uh, and then that's the point in time where you say, why the hell is there a CPU on the other end of this charging station? That's far more valuable to know than running around with a little USB condom assuming every, every charging USB port out there is out to get you. For these uh, bugs though, the correct answer would be using a software defined radio, something like the HackRF board by uh, Michael Osman, uh, Great Scott Gadgets. The software defined radio is, is a great thing in recent years. Instead of buying a $10,000, $30,000, $100,000 piece of gear to listen to, to radio spectrums, you basically buy a small board. I don't know how much the HackRFs go for, but uh, if you only a few hundred bucks, if that. Uh, you write software for them and it will listen into the spectrums that you're trying to listen in on. If you, si if you sit there, you can figure out what the ambient radio noise in any room or office is and simply listen for spikes or changes in this. When you see spikes or changes, perhaps it was associated when you were typing on your keyboard or when you had a computer on and now you can start ruling out things and find out what the hell is going on. Uh, I was asked by a reporter if I had any like a software that I was releasing for this or like a tool to detect the surveillance states and I have to clarify here that because nobody has come forward with an actual tangible uh, here is what the NSA or CIA or, or any other group is actually using, it would be inappropriate to, to design a detection tool because simply enough you wouldn't know what frequencies they're listening on. It's either going to false positive or never detect it at all and, and I'd be selling snake oil which is not something I want to do. Uh, which I guess a shout out though does go to the group uh, who in your cattle, in your DEF CON schedule you'll see the NSA playset talks. All of those guys are basically designing what the open source alternatives to these uh, uh, surveillance tools would be. So it's very interesting. Go find those talks and perhaps then you can be the one that creates or maybe I'll be the one that creates the detection tools just for the fun of it. Uh, but again it won't actually work in real, real life. The surveillance states you can assume are not using what the, op maybe they're not using the open source ones or maybe the surveillance, uh, or the NSA playset is just doing them a favor. It would be funny. Moving on, another way for hardware bugs to work is uh, data exfiltration methods or embedded, uh, embedded uh, compromising devices. Uh, for cotton mouth, this is a USB bug. It embeds in your USB either hub, in your USB device, in your USB cable directly. And again, it's used for USB injections over, the net, over a, a, an air link or an air gap. So it sends RF to this to start sending USB attacks onto a system. Ginsu uh, is, which is a PCI bus bug. You, uh, those here, who here is familiar with IPMI? 
How much? Ten uh, percent. So basically, IPMI is a control utility that is plugs into your PCI bus and it lets you do basically anything to the, the box. You can remotely administer the box by plugging this this PCI bo uh, PCI card. That's basically what Ginsu is. It's it's you know just now it's tailored for surveillance state usage. Uh, Howler Monkey, which is a series of RF transmitters, basically they don't spe specifically explain what they do, but Howler Monkey transmits RF for other utilities. Uh, Firewalk is an Ethernet bug. It can inject and/or monitor uh, traffic, basically a packet sniffer or a packet injector. For these, or, or any of these devices, which connect to a JTAG, which is uh, God Surge, which is a BIOS attack system, Compact Flashcards, Star Montana systems, they all mean basically it's a method of persistent compromise on a device. You either attack the BIOS, you attack the the peripherals. That's what all these devices are, and they all share one thing in common that they can be found if you look for them. So if you look in a system and you see surveillance SAM, you know there's something wrong. It means your kid has gotten into your computer. But <laughs> more importantly, if you look into a system and you see a PCI card that perhaps you don't know what it does or why it's plugged in, and you unplug it, and that black SUV again shows up about an hour later, then you know you have something going on. Or if nothing breaks, perhaps you just want to leave it unplugged and not try to worry about it. Some of these systems plug into JTAG headers, which here Surveillance Sam is inspecting. It's right below them. JTAG headers are headers that basically, uh, they're leads that go directly into a CPU. They're intended for usage uh, on mostly embedded systems. They also, God Surge, which was released in the NSA plate or the, the TAO catalog, was targeting a server from a certain vendor, which I probably shouldn't name to keep my job. Uh, but the idea is that simply enough they had leads that led, that they left it exposed on the board that when they shipped out, which is a very common thing for any vendor to do. It's used during debugging and development, uh, during the board's uh, basically debugging and development uh, process. It allows you to basically get into the CPU to find out what went wrong. It's way easier to do it that way, especially for embedded devices that have no monitors or keyboard inputs. You just plug into the JTAG port. It's kind of like a serial interface directly to the, the CPU. In fact, it pretty much is because it's slow as, slow as all. I'm trying to think of the wrong, the right expletive you use. Fill in your blank. The, uh, the key on detecting anything like this, you would assume that perhaps I'll never be able to detect something that's embedded into the system is that Remember that every vendor who ships a board is going to have every single PCB trace on the board. They aren't going to be doing, running uh, cables over the board to make connections that were hard to make because they didn't have enough layers. Pretty much everybody nowadays with the technology for PCB creation, they can make as many layers as they want. They'll pass the cost on to the consumer. Uh, this isn't the 1980s with the Apple II that you had to build yourself in, in a garage. Everybody, nobody has exposed leads, exposed wires. If you see one on a computer, perhaps you want to look up the manufacturer specs to see if that's connected to your CPU or to a, an existing JTAG or XTP or ITP header. That would be how you would find them. And again, how you find them is simply looking for the thing that doesn't belong. If you, what I have here is uh, two, two uh, med allergy pills and one laxative. If, uh, and specifically they're children's allergy medicine. So if you, if you can't tell what's wrong then perhaps you shouldn't be also be a parent who may accidentally give your sick child a laxative pill which doubles your problems. All right, let's move on to some software compromises. So software exploits basically attack firmware or BIOS. They, they aren't an embedded device, so you can't just open up your motherboard or open up your case and start looking inside for something that's creating the persistent compromise. What you would do is you would, you would actually, uh, oh, let me explain what they are. Swap and irate monk are basically master boot record or hard drive firmware attacks. Interestingly enough, in the last, well, master boot record attacks have existed for years. Hard drive firmware attacks have been recently popularized was at some other conferences. Wistful toll, a deity bounce, or motherboard bias, BIOS attacks. They rewrite your BIOS. This is there's been some some talk about uh, malicious BIOSes in the last year or so, and uh, the simple what's interesting is that the way they were detecting it, the way they were talking about it, I didn't see many people that were showing examples of the BIOS where you know you, that's basically what you would want to start looking at, start pulling off the data from the chip. It's it's very time consuming. It's very tedious. The flat the fast way to do it is just reflash the devices. Unfortunately, it's really uh, not going to tell you if anything, it, if anything was malicious on the device, you'd have to, the only way to do it, like I mentioned, is by pulling the, the firmware off of the device, pulling, finding a way to pull the BIOS off the device. Every device is going to be different, but pull, pull that data, 
get a copy of the firmware from the manufacturer, try to talk to them to see if it was what you would expect to see, and then do comparisons. If there's something comes up, then now you know what's going. Then now you know there's something interesting going on, and you can start debugging it or decompiling it to see what's going on. Again, nobody really came forward with any BIOS-based uh, malware found in the wild in the last year or so that actually explained this detailed and said, "Look, this is exactly where these attacks are." Uh, another way that kind of saves it. Uh, the problem with doing that is that it's really, really slow to pull uh, firmware off of a device. Normally, it's like I don't know, 900 baud or slower. Uh, it just feels like it takes forever. In the, this day and age where the internet is gigabits, uh, uh, something that's measured in basically bits, baud rate, is very sad. Um, there's a platform module, basically a system uh, chip called TPM, Trusted Platform Module, who is familiar with how they work. Uh, not many. Who here is familiar with how to hack them? Huh? Even less. One guy over there. Thank you. Somebody. Uh, I had somebody yell at me last time I gave something, last time I mentioned TPM. He just sat there shaking his head, Disappro disappointed as to what I was talking about. But the reality is, trust, what trust, let me explain. Trust platform module is a chip that holds a crypto key, a private key, and it securely holds that key so it cannot be pulled off. Well, there are attacks against it where you can basically tear, up, tear apart the chip and start pulling the data off the chip, and you'll be able to get the key, but that requires physical and destructive actions. Uh, you'll know something's wrong when you see that your chips are being desoldered using uh, acids and other other uh, kill, like basically yeah systems. If somebody needs to borrow your laptop and is is handing it back to you wearing a hazmat suit, you have something to cons be concerned about. It's gotten a lot of flack from the security community, mostly because p manufacturers enjoy using TPM to lock down hardware. They prevent changes to hardware. They'll be able to detect changes in hardware. They'll be able to detect changes in your in your device. And well, hackers don't like that because they, we want to change things. We want to modify stuff. We want to not be punished for doing that. What's funny is the inverse of this is that we want to use, we can use TPM to detect changes in devices. We can use TPM to, de to detect changes in firmware because it's a secured key that the, that anytime something changes, we can know that, you know, something changed, we need to look into this. It does it automatically, it does it much faster than physically pulling the firmware off of a device. The problem with it, though, is that it's only ever as good as it's, as it's been implemented. Most manufacturers do not impl implement TPM correctly. There are attacks against it, and as you can see in this picture, which I took when I was out, uh, out in the desert, uh, sometimes people don't understand security. They think putting a lock on it works. In this case, it wouldn't work for shit. I got to see what was inside that shed. It was a lot of rat poop. <laughs> I think some paint cans. So let's talk a little bit about Wi-Fi. There are two devices. Who here, who here has a, a Wi-Fi pineapple? Very good. You basically have exactly what this TAO playset was explaining. <laughs> Except for one of them is attached to a UAV or, a, or a, an airplane, or in this case, the special edition surveillance SAM black helicopter. Nightstand is effectively a Wi-Fi pineapple, nothing special, it's, it's in, but instead it looked like it was a laptop in a case that looked like it opened up and just probably just has a series of Wi-Fi based attacks that you can use. Sparrow was a, sim a very small form factor. It's a Wi-Fi device attached to a drone. You would use all of your same common sense with all of the Wi-Fi attacks that have existed for the last 10, 15 years to be able to detect these devices listening in on you or detect these devices in your area. If you have a Wi-Fi pineapple, it's a good thing. If you don't know what a Wi-Fi pineapple is, you're probably going to be compromised for this. Uh, these types of attacks, so uh, just turn Wi-Fi off unless you need it. Uh, there's not much more I can say here, uh, not to get into de too much details or not to get, spin off an entire talk about Wi-Fi based attacks, so I'm just going to quickly skip over it. Cellular networks is the final section. I think I'm going pretty good pace, a little bit fast, so uh, if anybody has any questions, again, feel free to let me know. So the networks are the final group where I'm, again, now making a large jump from the uh, basic hardware-based attacks. Uh, cell phone bugs, easy to say that we all rely on cell phones. I'm very familiar with people who rely on cell phones, uh, especially with the work that I did before. Any surveillance agency is going to be pushing to detect and monitor the cell phones and cell phone networks. Uh, it's just what they do. The, uh, I should say too that I forgot to mention earlier that I, I found a sense of, of pride when the re research that I released many years ago with the malicious cell phone charging kiosk actually ended up in a government document as to how to protect yourself while traveling abroad. So I apparently have also helped save the state <laughs> by letting them know to let their uh, 
their top operatives and government agents not charge cell phones when they're flying into China or Russia. Perhaps that free cell phone charging kiosk at the embassy isn't a good idea. It wasn't such a nice present. But none of, those, none, none of the uh, information released in the TAO catalog included uh, malicious cell phone charging kiosks, so I kind of felt sad. Uh, they didn't, none of that information got leaked. Uh, I will be adding, because I, I talked to Michael Osman uh, a little while ago, I will be adding the, uh, the juice jacking device and some so software for it to the NSA playset, which is, which is what he's releasing here at, at DEF CON. It's a series of tools that are all open source, so I'm going to actually be releasing that so somebody at least has something that looks kind of fun to to look at and you can explain a little, you can understand a little bit more exactly as to how these juice jacking malicious kiosks were, were, were using, what scripts I was using to pull data from phones and push data to phones. Uh, but going back to this, the cell phone bugs, they're basically grouped into two sections. There's malicious base stations, which is Cyclone, Crossbeam, Ebster, Interage, Nebula, Typho. And then there's intelligence gathering tools. The intelligence gathering tools were more like uh, hardware, like, uh, like a physical cell phone. These, these documents were released a while ago, so it was basically like their hack of some phone so they can use, use it for software defined radio, so they can listen to, to RF frequencies on, while on the ground, and it just looked like they were looking, looking at their cell phone. That's basically the majority of what they are. They can track cell phones using their cell phone, just look for signals, or they can, uh, one of them, a uh, very popular one was Candygram, which was a, a cell phone. Uh, tracker, basically, so they can follow you around, allegedly, if they give you a cell phone. So again, if you're traveling and uh, somebody from a government agency hands you a cell phone at random saying, here, use this while you're abroad, perhaps if you don't want to be tracked, don't use it. The uh, base stations, though, are an entirely different thing because it's not something that you physically have access to. You'll pretty much never know that a self malicious cell phone base station may exist unless you take specific action. Uh, here is a, is a basic idea as to what you would do. Uh, there are a lot of, basically listen out on cell phone networks, see what cell phone towers your cell phone may be able to peer with and have your cell phone let you know if something is new or something is changing. Obviously, uh, everybody when you move around, your cell phone towers will change, so the point of this type of system would be that you keep one cell phone uh, at your office in a, in a, in a, in a basically a static location. And you'll, I assume that cell, cell phone towers don't just pop up and go down, pop up and go down, unless somebody's doing something funky with a femtocell or their own rogue network. So that would be a reason for you to be concerned is to think wh what's happening in my area. Uh, perhaps you may find that the cell phone tower that was available at your office is now available at your home and then it followed you to the hotel down the street in another sta state. Maybe you want to see what's going on. Maybe you want to think a little bit. And now, the difference though is that you know that there is a cell phone tower for some reason that's following you. Uh, I don't have any software to release with this. Again, there would be, it would be, uh, I built some test uh, code, some proof of concepts. It's a lot of false positives, uh, especially whenever you start moving cell phones and cell phone towers kind of turn on and off on their own. So I wouldn't want to be releasing something that freaks everybody out. Uh, you have to, yeah, you have to make sure that the phone stays in a single location and things don't change too much around you. Also, I don't think anybody really needs that because not a lot of people keep their one cell phone in a state, static location except for maybe if you're stuck in an embassy trying to avoid extradition. I don't know how many people there are in, that wor in the world right now that might want it, but if that guy wants to buy this program, I'll sell it to him. <laughs> but again, back on ce cell phones, the main problem is that you do not control your network. You control your device to a degree, but you do not control your network. So you have to remember that once information leaves your hands, leaves your control, you actually have no control over this. And this doesn't stick with just cell phones. This is applicable towards servers, services, cloud, anything, star cloud, anything cloud related. So you have to remember, honestly, I have to give a hat tip and say, remember OPSEC at all times. Operational security, without it, you really will just be toiling in the dark, uh, playing, playing in a playground and failing to actually detect or know anything, uh, but you, you will be uh, detected and people will know what you're doing. If you remember to do OPSEC, it's the best, best solution here for people who uh, are concerned about these sort of things, especially if you use some of these methods to actually detect surveillance states, uh, then you want to be sure to apply operational security. And the, obviously detecting it will know if your operational security has, has failed or not. So I'm gonna give a conclusion here. I don't know if there were any other uh, questions. Nope. Just please feel free to uh, come up to a uh, to us uh, one of the microphones that are available out there, or find one of the speaker goons. Uh, the the majority of this was uh, mostly about a thought experiment. 
it's not, it, it was really to invoke discussion. Uh, bugs are detectable. Many of the information out there is, has been out there. It's been uh, discussed at hacker conferences uh, over the years. There's hard evidence which is best for more, more so than hearsay. Tinfoil hats are never stylish. Here is the uh, slide for any information for further reading. You can read the exact specific blog post where I go to some more details about the specific types of things that I was seeing. Uh, I'll leave this on while I, I guess there's some questions over here on the right. Yeah? Yeah, I have a question. Um, some of the major internet service providers are deploying a pilot where your wi home Wi Fi basically becomes public Wi Fi. How does this change things? Well, now you're offering service, you're becoming the ISP at your home. Well, how does it change things for, let's say, what the ISP or for your, yourself or your home or your, your worries of liability are being monitored? Right. I'm thinking more from, from liability of now your kind of uh, access point to people you don't know. Yeah. Uh, that, that gives you um, not liability, but that gives you plausible deniability. You can say, I don't know if I was that person or not. This is why I'm not giving, I'm not endorsing this necessarily. This is a, uh, do at your own risk, but opening up your Wi-Fi to have a, an open a Wi-Fi access point uh, allows you to say plausible deniability. This guy's like, hell no. Absolutely, yeah, it's, it's very risky to do that. <laughs> Anything can happen once you do that and you'll have to figure, you'll have to fight it off in courts but you'll have some consideration of plausible deniability, especially, but especially so if your ISP is the one that's turning it on for other people. Uh, mind you remember that if the ISP is controlling, you're, if the ISP is giving hardware that controls network for other people on the same ISP or some no other people as a Wi-Fi hotspot, they probably also have embedded something on that so they can do remote monitoring and caching. Uh, and again, that makes that hardware not your hardware but their hardware. Uh, so you don't own the hardware, you wouldn't be able to make changes or, 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 or be worried or basically control what's going on. Uh, I'll get the one guy behind you because I think it was lined up first and I'll come over to you. Um, are there uh <coughs> Are most of these tools uh, sort of made by hand by the NSA, CIA, or uh, the are they, catalog are that was explaining it? Uh, basically, the question, you know, are they made by hand? Are they made in house? The catalog that I was explaining it were had items available for sale. I don't know. I don't know if this was a the documents were released by a third party that was trying to sell it, kind of like a sky mall for all these surveillance actors. But the information on it, though, ex explicitly stated that the the hardware that they're using is things that are available off the shelf. Again, to reference the, the NSA playset talks, they're using items that are all off the shelf and you can make effectively the same things by just going to the store or ordering things from Amazon. Okay. Yep. And over here. Is, is there a reason you're not saying Jake Applebaum's name? I, I don't know. I just black, blacked out there. I couldn't hear who you were, who you were talking about. <laughs> Well, I guess I did. So that's that's the credit. <laughs> it's, it's due here. Yes, uh, Jacob Applebaum was the researcher uh, journalist who released the information for Der Spiegel. Uh, I, 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 you can talk to me later about it, especially after a few drinks. I'll be very, very candid. I'm doing it for his protection, not mine. <laughs> yes. Uh, your comments about uh, the TPM chips. Oh no! Are you from Trusted Platform Computing? <laughs> no, uh, but I am interested in TPM chips and now we're starting to see uh, similar devices being embedded in mainstream microprocessors from Freescale, Renesas. Mm -hmm. uh, those devices are typically called trust anchors now and uh, do you see that as uh, something that's going to continue to expand in various hardware fields? So yeah, is it going to expand? Are we going to continue to see trusted platform modules or, or trust anchors? Um, I don't know. I can't say. What I do know is that the people who are making these, who choose to pay to install them, are organized are businesses. So they're going to install it more than likely for a business purpose. So they're going to see it. So if they, if it's business viable for them to put it in, they're going to put it into the hardware. If it's not, I, I'll just be frank. They're probably not going to do it. If there was some awesome thing that made surveillance state uh, actors in basically, you Im it makes your hardware impervious to any sort of surveillance, more than likely no major vendor are going, are going to get behind that and make that available on the shelf. Um, but again, it's a, it's a two-sided thing. So while trusted platform modules or trust anchors can be used for the manufacturer to protect their investments so they can tell people that this is exactly how it works, uh, hopefully everybody here would know how to 
break into them, change them to make it so that we can protect ourselves from it. it it's going to be a weird give take and it's going to be between whether or not they have a financial reason to install those chips or, or help their bottom line. I've been told that the TPM chips are in many commercial devices today, like iPads. Is that true? Uh, I do not. I'm not aware. You can ask somebody from Apple, but I think their answer, I'll they give it to you. They won't answer. They will not confirm, nor do I. If you get them drunk enough, perhaps they'll answer, but that, uh, that's very difficult to do. All right. And I don't think any more questions. You, I don't know if you're going to hunt me down. <laughs> Afterwards, great. All right, I'm a little early. So, oh, well, one more question. Uh, you mentioned the software radios for finding uh, RF signals that yes. possibly you don't know what they are. Yep. Is there any, are there any good open source tools for triangulating them, figuring out where they're coming from? Oh, you, oh there's tons of stuff for that. Uh, look up uh, the software divine radio sites, GNU radio sites, uh, RT, I think it's RT-SDR, uh, I'm forgetting it offhand. Um, they're .com, basically RT-SDR.com. Search Google for software defined radio, you'll find this group. They do tons of stuff. They all release their information. They talk about how, into, how to do triangulations with series, uh, basically antenna arrays, things like that. Uh, all, that stuff, all that data is all online. I would really enjoy being able to get the time to look at more into it myself and give whole talks about it, but there are plenty of resources out there and that's easily well into the hour long talk to just even get over the basics <laughs> of, of doing triangulation or, or our stuff. It is key to note that software defined radio, I, I skipped over this in the slide, software defined radio, your hardware will have a limit. Uh, typically you'll see it between 2 to 5 gigahertz on the high end. Hack RF is about 2.4 gigahertz, 3 gigahertz. I apologize if I'm wrong. But it's, it's high. But there is a huge spectrum beyond the 3 gigahertz range that if any sort of surveillance tool is ha happening to work in those spectrums, good luck, I apologize. Uh, it will be tens of thousands of dollars for you to be able to acquire the hardware to actually do that detection. Just a, you know, fair warning. I'll go over here. Yeah, well, there is actually one last question. Uh -huh. Great presentation. You keep making references lately, of course, about having a few drinks and getting them drunk. <laughs> I'm, yeah. assuming, I'm assuming this is something that you've had experience in the past as far as getting the right information. I, I don't know if I was successful or not. I think I got too drunk in the process. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, the tower concept you were talking about, yes. uh, did that cover like LTE, S1 AP handovers, 4G to 3G handovers, or was it specific to one type of tower handover? It would be specific to the type of towers that you can. So you could do like yeah. an S1 AP handover and, and track that? Yeah, uh, there's, uh, that, that goes into, yeah, you don't actually own that hardware. You don't actually know what's going on. And also one of the major reasons why I didn't want to release anything that says this is the solution because cell networks can get way more convoluted and complicated than a simple app on your phone will ever be able to tell you what's happening. Yeah. Uh, so you need to know the S1 MME interface between the E node B and the MME and, and all sorts of stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, totally. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, I'm calling it. Thank you all for sticking around. Thank you.